Hey everyone, welcome to Anthrodish. Today I am interviewing Owen Campbell. Owen is a trans man with a passion for cooking, baking, and zatar spice. Uh, he started his culinary journey with a small fib in order to get a job at a soon-to-be-open restaurant on the west coast of Canada. After landing the job and working his way up, he eventually left the restaurant industry to cook for a housing program in Vancouver's downtown east side, where he remained until he and his husband decided to move to Manitoba. After a brief retirement from the food industry, uh, in which he completed a BA and then a master's in linguistics, he came back to his first love, which is food, um, to find a career in food security at Food Matters Manitoba, which is in Winnipeg. Uh, on today's episode, we talk about his experiences working with youth in Winnipeg through Food Matters Manitoba, uh, and we talk about some barriers that youth face when accessing food. We speak about the gendering that goes on in different food realms and how these impact queer and trans youth in particular. We also look at the food landscape in Winnipeg and discuss some of the challenges and the creative ways that Owen teaches youth to overcome these barriers. Uh, he's doing very important and very cool work, um, and Owen is such a fascinating guy after sitting down and talking with him um, and has so much experience working in the different ways in different ways with food over his life. So this was a super fun and very informative conversation. Um, I hope that you enjoy it as much as I enjoyed interviewing him. All right. Uh, so today on Anthrodish, we have Owen Campbell. Welcome, Owen. How are you doing today? Hi, thank you. I'm, I'm good today. Good. Glad to hear. Thank you so much for joining us. We're, or, I'm really excited. I don't know why I always say we on the show. <laughs> well, other people are doing, so. right? <laughs> It's like an authority thing, I think. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so can you start us off by providing some background on who you are, where you're from, and some of the early influences that uh, might have shaped your interest in food? Sure, I can try that. So I am from, I was born in uh, CFB Shiloh, Manitoba, which is a Canadian Forces base. So I was an army kid. Oh, cool. Uh, so I moved around, and not a lot. My dad retired pretty early, but enough have stuck with me. Uh, as well, my dad was uh, by trade, a chef in the army before he started doing Signal Corps. So, sort of grew up seeing mess hall kitchens, um, eating rations. My cousins and I, those were our favorite treats. <laughs> what are rations in terms of like, like, like army rations? So, uh, peanut butter in a tube, cheese whiz in a tube, oh my the gosh. best crackers. Like, a, they're not a soda cracker. My sister and I talk about it all the time. They're the best crackers I've ever had in my life. And you can't get them outside of an army ration. Interesting. Okay. Yeah. I mean, I guess I don't even know if they're the same still. It's been a number of decades. Uh, but they're just this delicious, buttery cracker. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> and seeing a lot of uh, turkeys with, uh, they're called uh, turkey frills, turkey booties. They're those little paper things that go on a whole turkey that's roasted. Okay. So my dad used to let me put those on the turkeys when he was roasting turkeys for for everybody sort of thing. Um, and I think that that was definitely a big influence in my life uh, to begin with, obviously, was was seeing big home-cooked meals be made frequently. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, and I think that sort of, I think that when I think about that now and I think about the way I like to cook now, that that sort of big, homey cooking feeling um, stuck with me. Much more so than anything military, so thank goodness for that. Yeah, fair, right? <laughs> <laughs> That's certainly a like really unique influence, though, on your life in terms of having the military and then also having a dad who was he a chef? You're saying? Yeah, yeah, by yeah. trade. Yeah, uh, I mean, he they trained him in in the army. Okay. To be a chef. So. Yeah, really unique uh, influences there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, cool. <laughs> I didn't really think about them until now. <laughs> That's so, the whole thanks. reason we hit this show. <laughs> <laughs> Amazing. <laughs> um, so can you uh, share with the audience, uh, you work at Food Matters Manitoba. So can you share what it is and what brought you there? Absolutely. So Food Matters, uh, we're, it's a food security, food justice sort of organization. We do a lot of partnering with community uh, champions, we call them, to increase access to good food in different communities, both in Winnipeg um, and uh, outside of Winnipeg in the north. Uh, we provide food skills education that incorporate like culture and tradition as well as nutritious foods. Uh, and that's the team that I work on. So I essentially 
get paid for children to make me dinner four nights a week, which is fantastic. Not a bad <laughs> um, gig. <laughs> not bad at all. And we also, you know, are big champions about a better food system happening through food policy, which is also important work uh, and community engagement. Um, and we try really hard to to listen to communities before we, we don't go in and tell people what they need. <laughs> we listen to what people need and then try and help facilitate that happening in communities. Amazing. And, uh, yeah. And so I guess what brought me there, I mean, I was in healthcare before this. Okay. Uh, coordinating uh, the trans health program at a community health center here in Winnipeg. And I had a friend here. I do. I still have a friend. He still works there. He's our <laughs> policy coordinator. I've been trying to get me to apply for work for a long time. And I didn't know. And then it was a moment where I was like, I really miss it. And here I am. <laughs> okay, cool. Yeah. <laughs> so kind of like a gradual transition into it, that job. Yeah, kind of. Yeah. It was <laughs> Nice. Um, so one thing you're talking about that I think is really cool, like you're talking about how your programs focus on creating like culturally relevant food, but also nutritional. Yeah. Um, but one idea that's kind of been circulating a lot recently is how food can be like if you think about nutrition, it's more than just like the biological nutri- nutrition. It's like the culturally nourishing part of that food as well. Yes. And you said nourishing and that sort of touches on exactly we're that we're trying to replace everything else with right now we're trying to replace healthy with that we're trying to replace healthful and nutritious all with nourishing um they, there's been where was I going with that? <laughs> sorry um yeah and so, so we like definitely nourishing you know food nourishes our hearts nourishes our souls and culturally especially here in manitoba i mean obviously with our indigenous community uh and trying you know settlers and colonialism trying to make amends for things that have happened food is really wrapped up in that and so being able to not only offer those cultural foods but for myself i mean i'm a a white settler uh being able to learn about those cultural foods and, and how before they became bad because of white people learning how they're so beautiful and and so nourishing to to folks is really a fantastic part of my job yeah that'd be that really veer off the question no not at all not at all it's totally cool if you do too like that's all <laughs> it's all good um so let's talk a little bit about uh food security um <laughs> can you in terms of like how you understand it or how you use it can you kind of give us a an outline of food security to you yeah, I mean, food security to me is sort of just what we were talking about before with nourishing, like making mm-hmm. sure that people have access to the food that they deem to be good food uh, that nourishes their hearts and their souls and their brains and their children, like in in all sorts of ways, not just in the way where our bodies live. Yeah, true. <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah, so like having that access to that food, having it be readily available, having it be monetarily available in whatever sort of way that means, um, that is food security to me personally. Nice. I like it. It's a good definition. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> um, and you kind of touched on this. So in terms of access, uh, what are some of the main like uh, forms of access or like barriers to access that you would see in your work? I mean... I feel like the obvious ones are sort of racism and classism mm-hmm. barriers, ageism is a barrier. Um, people, you know, in our North End, for there's you know there's a lot of talk about food deserts right now, and and I don't know enough to speak too much to them, but I do know that it isn't always necessarily that you just need to plop a grocery store down mm-hmm. in, in a place that doesn't have grocery stores because if you can't afford the food that's there, then it doesn't really matter. Yes. Um, so, so yeah, like having acts, like, you know, maybe it's community gardening where you donate part of your shares and, or maybe it's, you know, I don't know, membership, grocery store memberships. Like it's a thing that I think about all the time. I don't think there's an easy answer, but memberships where part of your money goes towards somebody else. I know that those are just small fixes. Yeah. But I mean, over the long term, like those are small you know, efforts on a personal level, but on the community level, that's a huge initiative that takes, you know, does have an influence, which is great. Yeah. And I think also like 
you know, I work in food skills and education, and so I'm teaching kids how to cook. And oftentimes people think, oh, well, what does that do to enhance food security? Mm -hmm. Um, And I think that it does it in smaller and different ways, uh, you know, where maybe kids are learning how to make something out of the leftovers that are in their fridge. And maybe they're learning how to cook with the weird and random foods that people donate to food banks. (laughs) The canned beans. Canned beans and water chestnuts. Really? Yes, it's so strange. Um, And I mean, food banks are just supposed to be an emergency gap, right? You know, like we have people living on food bank food. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and a lot of people when they donate don't really think about... No, people donate what's left in their cupboards. Yeah. (laughs) You know, you're sort of lucky if they check the expiration dates. Yes. Um, So, you know, I do... Yeah, like we do some stuff at work actually where we have... Uh, cook it. one of our other programs does a lesson plan where they learn how people learn how to cook with food bank foods and it's for geared toward other community uh, organizations that rely on food banks for like snacks and stuff right okay yeah and so you sort of talk about that like well what can I make with 18 cans of diced tomatoes <laughs> that's not just pasta sauce yeah right oh marinara yeah <laughs> <laughs> yeah that's <Exactly>. actually <laughs> really that's a very creative approach too because I think it's also like do you teach um people who don't rely on food banks how to cook with food bank food as well or is it more absolutely cool okay absolutely i do yeah i i do yeah fair. <laughs> yeah. okay but i think it's important because i mean it even you know it branches out to other things like it might not necessarily be random food bank things but what if there's a bunch of stuff on sale and that's all you can afford that week mm-hmm. like it's and it's good to know how to cook with all those things <laughs> yeah get creative with it get scrappy if yeah. you need to yeah very cool um, so with Food Matters Manitoba, uh, you said that you work primarily with youth. So mm-hmm. are there certain subgroups of youth that you tend to see more of than others? Uh, yeah, I mean, I primarily work with youth who are at risk for homelessness, They're marginalized youth. So, and those tend to be usually queer and trans kids, uh, newcomer kids and indigenous kids. Uh, Winnipeg also has a really, I mean, much like any major city in the country has a pretty big newcomer population. Mm -hmm. And so working with those kids as well um, for cooking. So that was the question. Yeah, yeah, for sure. (laughs) (laughs) Those are the subgroups. Those are the kids that I'm mostly seeing. So they're sort of, you know, at risk for homelessness, at risk for food insecurities, housing insecurities. Mm. I mean, they're facing racism. They're facing homophobia, transphobia, things like that. Very intense. Uh, yeah. um, so do you find, because there's a lot of variation, um, you know, particularly if you're working with a newcomer versus an Indigenous kid um, yeah. in terms of what foods they might have access to or what foods they would, you know, consider relevant to their to their lifestyles. So how do you navigate that? Yeah, it's a, the classes that I have right now are actually currently mostly split into like just a newcomer group or oh, nice. just an indigenous group or just and that just happens to be the way that they have fallen um although one of them is with it, like a newcomer program so that of course so there's not a lot of mixing right now for me um but definitely like newcomer kids especially and we actually food matters has a newcomer program um where you sort of are, so our program sort of speaks more to adults and you know learning where you can find your cultural foods in the city awesome. um, as well as how to you know navigate a western grocery store or how to cook with western foods the kids are a little bit different they whenever I ask them what they want to make they always want to make western things mm. they want to make spaghetti and meatballs they want to make cheeseburgers and french fries uh, they really badly want to be eating western food uh-huh. <laughs> so so they're kind of easy <laughs> to work with. They never want to make their food for me, although that's what I always want. Oh, yeah, I bet. <laughs> um, and then, you know, the Indigenous kids, some of them are, you know, have you know been born and raised in the city and have never gone out to their reserves or never gone up north and never hunted. And lots of them still hunt and fish or have parents that do or grannies and grandpas that do. And those kids... I mean, the kids, like, all, the kids are great. They're mostly just happy to do anything. They just want to be in the kitchen. Yeah. It's fantastic. That's great. Yeah, that's and very want to... Sorry. Oh, sorry. That was very helpful. <laughs> My throat yeah. started to like. That. Yeah, like they're they're just yeah they just want to be there and they want to show me the things that they do know and they're always super excited to talk about like whether they want to make the food or not like their their sort of cultural foods or not they definitely always want to talk about those foods and tell me that they know how to make them Amazing. or that they 
help their grannies make them or that they help their moms make them, which is also fantastic. Yeah, that's really, that's uplifting. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> um, so can you share a moment from your work um, with Food Matters Manitoba that really stuck with you or inspired you um, or like a moment or an event or something like that that was like very uh, memorable for you? Yeah, so I have, uh, I mean, there's at first, there's a million yeah. <laughs> because, <laughs> because they're youth and they are giving me hope in the world. Um, but there's definitely a time, I think, a story that I tell frequently. So when this young, I have this group of uh, young girls, this happens to always be girls that come to the class that I've been working with for about a year. And they vary in rage from a very in age, yeah. <laughs> from <laughs> about seven to 13 is my oldest. So one of the girls is uh, 12 now. And I noticed one day we were working and the kids, like I always give them the choice if they want to use a, a chef's knife or if they want to use a smaller knife. Um, I have chef's knives that have been made for children. Oh, cool. And I think that if they feel comfortable, I want them to feel comfortable using an actual real sharp knife because that's an important thing. And it feels really big to them too. So, so they all have their own knives. We're all working one day. There's about nine of them and me and this one young girl who I've known for about a year. I can just see her as I'm talking. She's, mm. she's sort of listening to me, but not not fully listening to me, but watching me, really, really watching my hands. And then she, you know, there's a certain way to hold your knife and to cut things safely and, and that quickly at the same time. And she's watching me do it. And then she would stop and she would look back down at her hands and she would reassess and readjust. And then she would start cutting again. And then she just kept doing this. And I saw this happening. And that was the very first moment in my work at Food Matters where I was just like, holy crap. Like she, I'm teaching someone something <laughs> and seeing her do it as I'm talking about it. And it, and it was beautiful. It was really beautiful. Um, and then all eight, nine of those kids just a few weeks ago, I allowed them to invite two family or friends to a dinner. They planned a menu wow. and they cooked 30 people. Oh my gosh. That's so cool. <laughs> And they served to 30, like to all these people as well. Like it was mostly parent, uh, family and siblings, like guardians and siblings. And it was beautiful. It was, it was great. They did such a fantastic job. And so I think that those, those two things together um, were and are, you know, the, some of the best stuff that's happened so far. Yeah, that is such a powerful example. I feel like that's um, like I have a daughter and I she's two right now and like she just mimics so much of what I do and you don't really realize how much they learn from like the small gestures in day-to-day -day life but um what really stands out in that story is just like you know you're not just teaching these kids how to make food you're teaching them a sense of like confidence in the kitchen that will extend towards other parts of their life which is so cool yeah and I mean and also of course because we had this dinner it gave me a great opportunity to have their guardians in the room and to talk about those things um and and those were the things that came out of the conversations you know that some of the girls it was just after mother's day that we did this and some of the girls uh, parents or aunties that they lived with said yeah you know we woke up in the morning and they had made me breakfast and they've never done that before mm. um or that they like to volunteer in the kitchen at church all the time and everybody notices a difference and even things like my uh, one parent or it might have been auntie told me that her daughter was super picky and I was like this kid eats everything like we did a tasting day one day where I brought in a whole bunch of weird and wacky things and by that I mean like olives and capers <laughs> and stuff um, as well as some delicious things like potato chips and chocolate <laughs> and they let me blindfold them and I gave them a spit dish I was like you don't have to swallow anything um but you should try and bite into it and every single one of them did and this kid tried everything and loved capers more than anything Wow. And her parent or her guardian was like, yeah, she used to be really picky and now she's not. And, I, you know, and that actually even hit me as that was more striking to me than even just the competence mm -hmm. sort of thing. Like this, you know, and she's only seven. She's one of my youngest kids. And she's, you know, all about capers now. That's great. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, yeah. she's right. They're the best. So they're really delicious. Yeah. <laughs> But yeah. that's, it's really, it's so cool that you're kind of helping these kids change their palates too, or like open their palates, Ooh. I suppose is a better way of putting that. Yeah. Very neat. Yeah. Um, <laughs> okay. So let's talk a little bit about gender and food because that's kind of a, uh, there have been, you know, like they're, they're themes that come together in very significant and challenging ways. So yeah. 
Um, in your personal experiences um, and your experiences working with uh, non-binary and trans youth, can you speak to some of the ways that you've seen food being gendered? Um, and are there harmful repercussions to that? Right. I mean, yeah, absolutely. And so I think that even at the most basic level, if you look at like, you know, the class that I was just speaking about where they had a dinner and it's all girls that come to that class, that class is a drop in class. So anybody can come and I've never had a boy show up. Mm, interesting. Not even one single time. And that's not all of my classes. Like in, in many of the, that's actually the only one where that's ever happened, but it's still a thing that's happening. Um, and I think that that sort of speaks to, it's not, it's definitely not the staff yeah. <laughs> uh, of, of the Boys and Girls Club um, that aren't letting boys come. It's the boys who are choosing to not come. And that is interesting, of course. Mm -hmm. uh, I grew up, you know, before this, I worked in kitchens uh, and, and I'm trans. And so when I was working in kitchens, it was pre-transition. And so I was uh, female identifying, I guess, at the time. Uh, and the kitchens are so misogynistic. And I think, yes. you know, we're, we're starting to hear about those things now, right? Like, Anthony Bourdain, <laughs> rest his soul, uh, wrote a beautiful book, Kitchen Confidential. And I love that book. And I read it when I was, you know, still identifying as a woman and was just like, yeah, this is it. It's gross. It's disgusting. Like, it's horrible. And I feel like I was lucky because I was also identifying as a queer woman. And so I felt like I could at least, quote unquote, bro down with the boys mm. and feel a little bit safer around it. And I, I don't think as a gay man that I would feel, I would feel even less comfortable. Um now being in the kitchen <laughs> in the kitchen I think and I think we see that like yeah even you know at the most basic and binary level men get paid to cook mm -hmm. and women cook in the home yes actually yeah wow <laughs> as soon as he painted yeah. that visual it's like whoa <laughs> like men don't cook at home or it, it, and things are getting better like I, sh I mean Certainly. I shouldn't say that that is but I don't want to paint the whole world with that conventionally conventionally women stay home and don't get paid to cook and mm. men get a, quite a bit of money sometimes yeah to cook and be chefs and, and even now like when you you know even watching television shows in the food network which is huge like most of those chefs are men still yes you know and and that's it, it it's weird and I don't understand I mean I obviously understand it I do understand it patriarchy men get paid for things women <laughs> don't <laughs> um, <laughs> yep. right and I think you know it's it's super important to me especially with the queer and trans and non-binary youth because you know like what kids sometimes aren't allowed to cook in the kitchen because of who their parents are sort of thing so our little boys being allowed to or our little trans girls who haven't come out yet being denied this thing that they just really want to do which is cook with their moms mm -hmm. or learn with their moms because it is so very gendered and we still have that sort of cultural thing around it you know and so I think about those kids and what they're missing out on yeah, absolutely. And, it, and it's super crummy. And I even like I have the story about my old workplace when I was in transition and leaving my old workplace to come to this new job. One of my coworkers is this lovely woman who's in her mid 50s, I guess. Her sons are probably in their mid 20s now. And she was telling me this story about when she's and she's she's a fantastic woman. And like she's I mean, I, I feminist ish sort of thing. <laughs> like what wave are we talking here? <laughs> probably second. But, uh, <laughs> But as I mean, soon as you have the ish, I'm like, oh, it's second wave. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, she's definitely not the type of person that, like, she would not have raised her sons, or she wouldn't have knowingly raised her sons to think, you know, less of women or anything like that. And her right. husband was very progressive as well and whatnot. And so she's telling me a story about when her oldest boy went off to college, he called her one day and was like, I need help to make soup because he didn't know A, how to open a can of soup. Oh my gosh. Or B, how to cook it. <laughs> <laughs> You just put it in a pot till it's hot. Yeah. <laughs> or the micro, you know? And I just think, you know, that's that's someone who's my sister's age. Like, that woman is not even that much older than I am. Um, and even unknowingly, like, you raised your sons like this. And she said to me, that story ended with, I failed my children. Can you please help with the rest <laughs> of them? <laughs> like, I will do my best. Yeah, fair. Um, yeah, and so that, you know, it happens even when we're not looking, mm -hmm. I guess, or, or when we think we're better than that. And, yeah, and even I actually was just uh, asked to teach a course at the University of Winnipeg oh, cool. here on uh, food culture, sex, and gender. Oh my gosh, I love and it. So, I know, I, I want to take it. Yeah, right. I want to <laughs> take it. <laughs> That's what I'll teach it. But, yeah, and, and you know, there's a lot of, there's been some work done on, uh, you know, how, how queer, how same-sex couples sort of split up 
food and, and grocery shopping and all of that and it's really you know that stuff is sort of just coming to light now mm. I feel like I went off on a tangent no it's a cool tangent and that's something <laughs> I uh like in terms of queer couples I always find it uh I think I was reading something about how or maybe it was a podcast I can't remember like they're talking about how um some queer couples are following into like the conventional uh cooking rule or like gender roles within right. cooking um yeah. or in terms of labor without necessarily being aware of it which i find really interesting like how people will just fall into the same sorts of norms even though yeah. they're yeah you know pushing past that yeah because it's just so typical because it's all around us and mm -hmm. there's this one uh paper chapter i guess in a book that i read just recently and it's pretty like it's not a new uh, it's not a new chapter. It's not new research. It was quite old, actually, like from the late '90s, maybe. Okay. Um, and it's called some. I think it's called "Feeding Our Lesby Gay Families." Oh, nice. So, like, lesby, gay, bi, gay. Anyway, <laughs> I uh, see. Okay. <laughs> and how even when, you know, like my partner and I, for instance, I do most of the cooking. I do all the cooking in the house, and it's because I love it. Also, yes. not just because I feel I have to. And so they're talking about how people that do the cooking and people that do the grocery shopping are usually a couple will tell you that they're two different people. Like I do the cu cooking and I would normally typically tell you that my partner does the grocery shopping. Yeah. But then it turns out that those things aren't actually true and that I also do grocery shopping, but I do it every day in a very small way because I'm always thinking about what I'm going to make for dinner. Oh my gosh. And so I know what's in the fridge and I'm like, oh, okay, well I have to get this. And actually what my husband is shopping for is the staples. Yes. Big things or toilet paper or Oh my gosh. Or whatever. And then how, you know, when you ask someone, and they were focusing only on same sex families, and maybe this happens, in, in, and I'm sure it does actually happen, probably even more so in a straight fit couple. <laughs> yeah. um, but how, if you ask, you know, the person who doesn't do the cooking what their partner's favorite foods are, they'll tell you some things. But then when you ask the partner who does the cooking, they'll tell you like all these other things. Yeah. <laughs> they also know all of the actual things of the partner because <laughs> they do the cooking <laughs> the nuances <laughs> yeah so yeah. and it's really interesting um you know about how and, and like you were saying as well about how those things just sort of do fall and somehow all of a sudden it's gendered even when it's not gendered <laughs> yeah or even like when it's flipped like in in uh so my partner and i like he does all the cooking and I don't like I buy the staples, which I didn't realize until you just said that. Um, <laughs> I didn't realize it either. <laughs> yeah, that's blowing my mind, but it's so yeah. accurate. And it's like you really don't, you know, even though things have kind of been swapped in terms of like who goes to work or who cooks, it's still right. the same roles. It's just been swapped. Yeah. Yeah. So like, has it changed? Like, yeah. So there's still roles. Like that's the yeah. thing, which is, and uh, you know, are we falling into those roles because like I genuinely love to cook, like it, it, mm -hmm. it is my love language. I like to feed people. I like to do all of those things. Um, I like watching people eat. I like making good food for people. So it feels normal and natural that it would fall to me. But then, yeah, you know, you look at research and you're just like, but why? Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> Man. Yeah. So I mean, I guess I'm trying, trying to change that or trying to throw some wrenches into that and True. let kids know the youth know that they they can all do all the things in the kitchen and even even that like I have found uh sometimes my I have one class that is just newcomer kids and it's because it's with a newcomer organization cool and so it's usually pretty fairly evenly split boys and girls uh the girls they're older teens they're probably between 16 and 19 and the girls are fantastic cooks. They are fantastic. They have fantastic knife skills. They've clearly been cooking with their mothers for their entire lives. And the, the boys are, they're okay. <laughs> they're, they're boys. They're teenage boys. They're not sure. horrible. Yeah. Um, and, and they enjoy being there. Like, they really want to be there. But when it comes to other chores in the kitchen, like, I'm a big uh, proponent of cleaning as you go. So that when we all, part of my work is that we don't just cook. We sit down and we eat together. Nice at the end of, of that cooking class as long as there's time um, <laughs> and so if we clean as we go then we're more likely to have that time and, and there are some boys in that class uh who have taken to telling me that in their culture boys aren't allowed men aren't allowed to do the dishes mm. and I don't know whether that is true or not um and you know <laughs> what I come back with is that's really interesting and I love learning about new cultures and in our culture only the boys do the dishes 
So <laughs> Oh, I like that. <laughs> we better get started. Uh and, and they they laugh at me and they do the dishes, but I think that, <laughs> that those things too, right? Like it's okay for men to cook, mm-hmm. but it's less okay for men to clean up afterward. Big time. Yeah. Or, you know, yeah. So and, and even sort of in that sense, the gendering of it all. Yeah, like the labor that goes into it, not just the food prep, but the yeah, yeah, the cleaning up, the setting the table, things like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely. You have a master's in linguistics, um, which is so cool to me because it like linguistics was one of those things that never my brain just like never understood how people could do that. Like it just I don't know. There's something about it that didn't click for me. So I'm always like fascinated when people understand linguistics. Sweet. Um, so is there a linguistics of food? Um, and what sorts of themes or ideas would you look at if there was a linguistics of food path? Okay. So there definitely is linguistics of food. Sweet. Um, as a caveat, although I have that degree, uh, my focus was never uh functional or theoretical linguistics my focus has always been sociolinguistics and so I think that you actually would probably love what I do (laughs) because I'm although I have to know the scientific parts of linguistics as well my knowledge is actually pretty basic around those things I did what I had to do to (laughs) to get get my course (laughs) we've all done that Um, but I'm not a syntactician I'm not a phonologist I'm not any of those things I look at the sociology of linguist like of language okay Um, which is probably much more up your alley. <laughs> so yeah, it's already, I'm like, oh, all right. So exactly. what does what does that uh, mean? Can you explain? So, well, when I did my degree, I looked at queer linguistics. So I was looking at mm. uh, how, uh, how drag queens speak. Oh, anyway. amazing. Okay. Yeah. So, but the linguistics of food, so, so I also only, like, I'm sure there must be other, uh, like, syntactical sort of ways to look at the linguistics of food. But I, again, have taken more of a sociological Anthropo- anthropological look at them cool um and and it's definitely so i have an example i i found an example because i was like there's just so much i should nail it down to one thing okay so yeah i'm so, so excited one of the things i love so there's uh this excuse me linguist in the states uh dan jarofsky he's a he's actually a computational linguist but anyway which is beyond me uh, but <laughs> so he talks about ketchup so so things that we see every single day and lots of things like obviously are named up uh, like hamburgers, that's a place. Mm-hmm. Right? Like Frankfurters, that's a place. French fries, not really a place, but still, and it's actually but, Belgium. Yeah. But <laughs> <laughs> so when we look at ketchup now, a ketchup bottle says tomato ketchup on it. Um, and you would think to yourself, why does it have to say tomato? Because that's what ketchup is, mm-hmm. right? But then we rewind a few thousand <laughs> years. And so ketchup, I'll make this story very short. It's a very long story, was originally in Asia, in China and Vietnam sort of area uh, to to preserve fish before there was any like refrigeration and ice mm. type thing to preserve with, they would use salt and rice okay. to preserve it. And so then that would, you know, break down the fish and cook it and it would be a bit more like a ham texture, but it would keep it for longer. And so that sort of saucy fermentation turned into what we know as fish sauce. Okay. okay? So then colonizers start colonizing and they really like this fish sauce and it's called ketchup. Ah, okay. Um, I, I could spell it. For, I tried to find the IPA for it and to send it to you, but I didn't. Anyway, okay. so which obviously sounds like ketchup. Yes. Right. And it means, uh, ga means, or chip means sauce. And I think ga might mean fish. Like it literally means fish sauce. Okay. So like very literal mm-hmm. translation. Yes. So the British bring that back to Europe. They pronounce it ketchup. It's an important trade commodity. Knockoffs start getting made. It eventually, like it, for a very long time, was still very uh, fishy. Like it always had anchovies in it, mm. um, which we don't have anymore, of course. It was definitely more fishy. But then eventually turned into a pepper, sorry, pepper, into a tomato okay. ketchup. And if you go to places like we just got to save on foods here and they have a British aisle oh. where it's all British food and they have different flavored ketchups. Ours says tomato ketchup because that's what we eat here in North America. Right. When in Canada. But there are other ketchups. And so this sort of like linguistic, like, I mean, this is the linguistics of food. You're looking at how the words sort of became something else. Oh, cool. 
That's so cool. I love that. Sort of. It's a thing. There's a really good, uh, I can send you if you want to watch it. Dan Jarofsky does a whole, uh, like there's a videotape lecture. Oh, cool. Yeah. Send it to me YouTube, and I'll so. add it to the show notes too. So if anyone okay. else wants to look at yeah, it. Yeah, it's again. really fascinating. One, he starts with this sort of story. Uh, so that it's, so it's in the beginning, uh, which is great because the rest of it is computational linguistics, which maybe not everybody's into. <laughs> I'm not. <laughs> and there's also been, you know, like other linguists, Arnold Zwicky has done some, uh, written some books and articles on uh, like the linguistics of menus and how Ooh, um, cool. they're written. I haven't read any of them, so I can't actually speak to them, but I know that they're out there. Very cool. Um, That's I'm currently trying to find more of them because I want to sort of slide some of them into this food culture and sex and gender class. Yeah, somehow. that would be really cool. Because I'm sure, I mean, even when we talk about foods, you know, like people talk about oysters being an aphrodisiac and they say that that is because they look like female genitalia, you know, like, so mm. those things are also sort of linguistic-y. Yeah, uh, true. Like how that's kind of gotten translated or kind of like the broken telephone of it throughout yeah, history. Yeah. So, cool. I'm, you know, trying to find some more stuff on that, but I can't speak to a ton of it. <laughs> but still, that's a super cool thing to think about. Just like, yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah, it's that. pretty fascinating. Yeah. <laughs> 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 Neat. Uh, okay, so you live in Winnipeg. Um, let's talk a little bit about the food landscape in Winnipeg because I found, so I lived there for two years um, and I really struggled in the winter to find affordable produce, especially being from like, you know, Southern Ontario where you can get anything at any time. Yeah. Um, so it was like a huge eye opener for me. Um, did you, so was I looking in the wrong places when I lived there or like, do you have some sort of insider knowledge on food access and security in a Winnipeg winter? No. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Winnipeg is a barren wasteland. Oh. Uh, I, my partner, my husband and I moved back here. Uh, we've been back for about nine years, but we moved here from Vancouver. Oh my gosh. And so I didn't grow up in Winnipeg because I was in the army. So we had moved around and um, but having lived, you know, for the last 10 years of my life in Vancouver before I came here, I was spoiled. Like yes. I could just walk down Commercial Drive and buy fresh produce on my way home in January or February or March or whatever. It didn't matter. Uh, and then we moved here. and It was a rude awakening. Like, first of all, I can barely find the fresh produce. And then when I do, it's ridiculously expensive. And, you know, yes. and that's one of the problems that we face here in Winnipeg is that that sort of is the problem around food security is mm -hmm. it's expensive to get it here. It's not really fresh. He's new when we get it here. I think, you know, the way that Manitobans, prairie people in general, have sort of tried to combat that is we pickle things. Ah, uh, yes. Okay. Yeah. That makes sense. We, we jar things. Um, there's greenhouses now. <laughs> but oh, I mean, really? you can't, you know, do you have a greenhouse in your yard? No. No. Yeah. <laughs> so, so I think you sort of just try and do what you can here with root vegetables yeah fair there's oh i ate so many potatoes when i lived there yeah so you can sort of keep them right like mm. i generally have a box of beets in the basement nice there, or would like to have a box of beets in the basement over the whole winter you know carrots keep yes you know those types of hearty things that keep but yeah i wish wish that i had a magical answer and maybe there is one and i'm missing it too i don't know <laughs> we'll keep looking <laughs> maybe somebody will hear this and tell right. us yeah. about that magical answer like but it's you know, it's a, it's a it's sad fact of life that things in Winnipeg produce, especially fresh produce, is super expensive. Yeah. I mean, one of the things I think that people have a hard time getting over, maybe, or believing or thinking is that, that it, things don't always have to be fresh, right? Like, mm -hmm. frozen food is usually frozen at its peak. Yes. Time. And so buying frozen broccoli when you live in Winnipeg and it's minus 30 in the middle of January <laughs> is fine. Absolutely. <laughs> like, yeah. You know, or, yeah, or, or you do things like, you know, again, I mean, it's not necessarily buying, but if you have the luxury of being able to grow your own food, mm -hmm. then, you know, you either can those things or pickle those things or freeze them if you have the space and, and the luxury to be able to do that too, right? And, and I do, which is fantastic. And I'm very grateful for that. Uh, but, you know, you, you puree your broccoli and you freeze it you throw it in stews in January. True. That's a but good you idea. definitely cannot find cheap. No. Lettuce no. Spinach. Oh my gosh. I remember like I for whatever reason got it in my head that I really wanted blueberries and mm. um I I lived there during that winter that was like negative 50. 
Uh, uh -huh. um, and like, I remember that week there was the, the shelves were empty in Winnipeg. Like there was yeah. just nothing there. And all I wanted was blueberries. And I finally found some and it was like $13 for, you know, a tiny little quart of it. Yeah. And I was so determined that I bought it, even though like I didn't really have the means at that point yeah. to yeah be spending yes. on that. Yes. Oh, yeah. And I, mean, and I mean, if you think about that and then you think about the fact that, you know, in in our northern communities, mm -hmm. that's what they pay all the time. Yes. Or more. I mean, Churchill hasn't had a train in over a year. Yeah. Yeah. Like, the situation I mean, and we all, I mean, maybe we don't all know, but it's definitely, you know, these things are being talked about more now about the price of things in the North and how ridiculous it is and how even when you can find something, it's oftentimes rotten. Mm -hmm. and it's still $12 for a head of iceberg lettuce or whatever. Um, and then, you know, Churchill can't get food because they don't have a train track anymore and they haven't for over a year. And yeah, like it's, it's pretty, it can be pretty awful sometimes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and also like very eye-opening for people who live, you know, in, in the, or on the West coast or in Ontario, mm. where you have all that access and you don't like, you really don't appreciate how yeah. much you have there until you move somewhere else. Yeah. Like I definitely did not. And I mean, even the difference when I lived in Vancouver, my last job there was working as a cook at, at a housing program, like in a, one of the housing programs in density in cool. Vancouver. Um, and so, you know, cooking for clients or whatever. And then, thinking at the time that you know we had such a small budget and we couldn't really get a lot of things and you always just want to give people actually good food like I don't want to give people crappy food like mm. their lives are already shitty like I don't want to give them rotten food or whatever and then moving here and I worked in a shelter here and I didn't work in the kitchen but I saw the kitchen and the type of food we got here and I was just like oh <laughs> yeah standards are changing we were now. so lucky in Vancouver and I mean which mm -hmm. again is a big city that is progressive in many many ways and that we don't have you know like Vancouver for instance has uh or at least it did at the time when I was there I think they still do have a grocery store that other I think how it works is other grocery stores will give them their things that they can't sell anymore but that are still edible and sellable but they're not pretty enough oh yeah yeah and then they sell it back to the community for a very reduced rate awesome very so to regular like to people can come in as well as to community organizations, like we would shop there sometimes. Oh, nice. That's yeah, great. like they'd be like, you know, here's this box of hamburgers, but it doesn't have a label. Right. Not sell it in the grocery store, but it's fine and it's still within its expiry date, so we can buy it and use it. You know, like Winnipeg could because we have so much food waste in the world. So yeah. Winnipeg, and it's truly really like it. It's always shocking to me things like you know not having the proper label on a burger patty <laughs> is enough to <laughs> not sell it. It's just I know. Ugh. I know. Which is, I mean, I guess if if we deal with it in a way like like that, mm -hmm. where we can get it to somebody else for a very cheap price, then that's fantastic. Then great, screw up all the labels. Absolutely, yeah. Uh, <laughs> but I mean, I guess the fact of the matter is, most of the time, that's not what's happening. Yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> but yeah. there's change. There's some positive change at least. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. I think there's sure. <laughs> Yeah. yeah. So one day Winnipeg might have fresh produce that's cheaper in the winter. Who knows? <laughs> well, climate change. Let's be real. Oh, oh God. Right. Oh, sorry, this got so bleak. Yeah. <laughs> oh. Okay, so I'm going to change to a more fun note. Um, okay. After that. Um, so what was the weirdest food experience that you've ever had? Okay. Weirdest food experience that I've ever ever had oh my gosh oh gosh okay so <laughs> the excitement. It, it's not it's, i mean i don't know how anyway doesn't matter so <laughs> my husband and i and another uh gay male couple friend of our two other friends like and two other friends so six gay men we all go to puerto vallarta together uh this is just not this winter that just passed but the winter before so we get there and one of our friends who's with us he also went to school in mexico and speaks spanish fluently That's so useful. We leave, very useful. So we leave the condo the very first, and we just rented a condo in Puerto Vallarta. Like we didn't stay in the fancy neighborhood. We were just like where regular people, typical people, live. So nice. it was like a working class neighborhood. So we leave, and we're just walking down the street, sort of looking for a place for breakfast. And uh, our friend, we see this sort of, well, what we thought was a restaurant. So we went up, and our friend who speaks Spanish, he went and he spoke to them because he wasn't sure. He's like, well, it's either a restaurant that they run out of their house, or maybe it's a birthday party. Who knows? And they're like, no, 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 it's a restaurant. Come and eat, come and eat. We're like, okay. So we go and we sit down. It's our very first morning in, in Puerto Vallarta together. Uh, and they don't even have a menu. Like the guy just has pictures on his cell phone that he's showing us of the food. And so he goes away. Our friend uh, 
it says, yes, 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 that all sounds great. And so he goes away and he explains to us that part of the meal includes tripe soup. Okay. So so we all so tripe is this like stomach lining of a cow usually or oh, okay, cow, okay. cow or pig. Okay. Uh, which I've had like it's oftentimes in pho and, and things I've had it before, right. but it's not my favorite. Yeah, fair. But we were like, okay, like a bowl of it. He said it was the first part or the second part of it. It was like there's a bigger part first and then this and then an ending part. We we're like, okay. So then it turns out though that the tripe soup is the first part of the meal. And I thankfully, our friend who spoke Spanish was like, Do you want to just share a bowl with me? Mm-hmm. And yeah, I think I do. He's like, okay, I think that's a good idea. And when the bowls came, they were bigger than my head. Oh my there gosh. was so much tripe in there. And, and tripe doesn't necessarily have a very strong taste, but the texture is very weirdly, like, I guess it's kind of like calamari, but okay. tougher. Oh, okay. Um, this is not. And, and the pieces are quite big. It looks like honeycomb. Whoa. And this the, is not what I'm expecting at all. Like, I've never. <laughs> So we, of course, don't want to be rude. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, I, but mostly we just, my friend and I who shared the bowl, thank goodness. We, and the broth was delicious. Like it was so good, but nice. the tripe was a little much. So we would just cut it into pieces and swallow it because it's very rubbery. Oh my gosh. <laughs> so we can swallow it whole without chewing it. And it felt a little bit like fear factor. Oh, yeah. That sounds like it. And it was fantastic. And then he's like, I mean, it wasn't, but we finished it. And thankfully, the last part of it, then we had another thing, which I can't, I think it might have been beans and rice was the second thing. And the last thing was pineapple empanadas, which oh were my gosh. fantastic. Oh, that sounds so good. Thankfully, that's what ended the meal. But yeah, it was, it was, yeah, kind of interesting and weird. I feel like that's mm-hmm. the weirdest food story I have. That's a great story. Like that's, <laughs> there's so much detail about like texture and flavor in there. Wait, that's very, I mean, got, my yeah. friend and I that shared it just looked at the others and were just like, <laughs> Because <laughs> they all shared a bowl too, because oh. they were stuck on like trying to stomach this whole like good pun egg. right there. It, became, it must have been a pound of tripe. It was oh my gosh, a it's a lot of <laughs> a lot of internal organs there, a lot of stomach lining, and there were a lot of jokes about honeycomb, like the honeycomb of the insides, and I don't know. Anyway, <laughs> that was our first day. It was fantastic. They were wonderful hosts. It was a lovely place. Awesome. It was nice. They were so fantastic with us um it was great <laughs> <laughs> that sounds like a great start though <laughs> it, was, it was it was a great week <laughs> nice that's awesome um all right well owen thank you so much for joining me on anther dish i really enjoyed talking to you and uh Thanks for having me it was really fun it was less stressful than i thought it was going to be yay that's i'm so glad to hear that because i don't want this to be a stressful thing ever for anyone <laughs> of course <laughs> That was Owen Campbell, who works in food skills and education at Food Matters Manitoba. After the episode, we talked a little bit about his upcoming food, gender, and culture course at the University of Winnipeg. Um, So stay tuned for updates on this, because I definitely want to have him back to talk about some of the fascinating food knowledge that he's coming across in those lectures. You can find the link to the Dan Jurafsky lecture that he was talking about, which is called The Linguistics of Food, Innovation, and Community, Uh, and that'll be in the show notes below. Thank you so much for tuning into Anthrodish. It really does mean the world to me, Uh, and I will see you next time. I can never say that without being weird. I'm just not going to have a catchphrase. It just doesn't work that way. (laughs) 